Okay, let's do this. Huh? Um, so, just like a, a little quick one, um, I hate talks that uh, just go through like to-do lists and like code the whole time. It's not going to be one of those talks. Uh, but the flip side of that means that you guys have to ask questions or participate, or else this is going to be really boring for everybody involved. Um, so I invite you not to even raise your hand. If you have a question, just ask it, uh, and we're going to try to go for controlled chaos here, and we're going to see what happens. Uh, if it fails miserably, uh, I'll blame this guy. Um, so just real quick about me. Um, uh, I founded a small startup here in, um, that's blinding, uh, in Boston called Embedly. Uh, we deal with, we're a cloud API company, so you're going to hear that word a lot because I love that word and uh, it makes me money, so uh, we're going to continue using that word a lot and you guys are going to love it by the end of this talk. Uh, these are ways to get in contact with me. Uh, if you want to tweet uh, nasty things to me, I suggest you do it now before I get back to my computer. <laughs> um, so what we did. So um, I've been using Django since uh, since I started web development, which is in 2006, 2007. Um, we had Embedly. Uh, our API is run off of Tornado, which is another Python fun stuff. But the all the back end, like, um, uh, account stuff is all run off of Django. Uh, so Postgres DB, fun things. Uh, about six months ago, we migrated all that stuff to use um, Ember instead. So all, these are just stupid screenshots of like uh, analytics and um, you know regenerate keys, things like that. Um, the reason why we like it at uh, Embedly is because of the fact that we have multiple different services serving these APIs. So we have an analytics. API endpoint, we have use, uh, user information, we have uh, URL information, all comes from different uh, segments. Um, so uh, using a JavaScript MVC really worked uh, well for us. Um, has anybody played with Angular, Ember, Knockout? Have you ever used it in a production system? Yeah. Bob, put your hand down. <laughs> Bob, work, they, those guys work for me, so they, they're going to idiots through the half of this thing. Um, uh, JavaScript MVC, uh, generally sort of newish. Uh, it's the idea of single page applications. Um, uh, it's the idea that you serve one HTML file and JavaScript takes care of all the routing, hashing, uh, loading new dynamic uh, content. And we've all heard of this, so I'm just repeating it, uh, just so we're all uh, on the same page. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, there's like 12 more of these. Uh, pretty much anybody that uh, loves Node writes their own MVC framework and puts it on GitHub. Um, half of them are crap. There's a few good ones. Uh, Backbone is obviously uh, sort of the leader, but it's like 600 lines of code. It's like ridiculously small. So it's pretty limited in the feature set, which they uh, think is a actual good thing. Uh, other people like Angular and Ember think it's a bad thing, so they wrote uh, a bunch more code on top of that. Uh, everything on the right here I've never used before. Actually, your left. No, your right, my left. Uh, we'll get there in a second. Um, I've never used before, but uh, some websites said that they are those things. Uh, we chose Ember because of, I'm talking really fast, and no one's asked a question yet, so I feel bad about myself. Um, we used Ember because of sort of the reliance on jQuery. Um, so you all grow up and you're like, okay, you're not supposed to use general JavaScript. You're supposed to use um, jQuery because it takes care of all those browsers things. And now we're going to the next step of that. But jQuery allows us to sort of build Ember. It builds on top of jQuery. Uh, and it's also very object oriented, uh, which is one of the things that we like about Python. Um, so therefore, it was just a logical choice. Uh, Angular stays a little bit closer to the HTML, so if you're like a huge HTML fan, uh, Angular is probably the best choice. And uh, if you want to write most of your own stuff, Backbone is probably the way to go. Um, I'm being recorded right now, so that may be wrong. I just want to add that stipulation. <laughs> um, this is a fun question. Um, why would you do this? Right. So why would you move everything up to stack to sort of the browser? Um, uh, so there's some good things about it and there's some bad things about it. Some of the bad things are SEO. You have to build like multiple pages. So if you want like a, a traditional browsers, uh, crawlers to get your content, you have to uh, build multiple pages. This is what um, Discourse does. So they have like two different versions of the pages, one's for crawlers, one's for not. Google's smart enough to do it with. Uh, and Bedley as a crawler is not, so you should do both of those things.
things to make our lives easier. Um, but single page applications give sort of a, um, a much more responsive feel. They feel like an actual application uh, on a desktop and not something that is built for the web. Um, if you are sort of a believer in what we believe in, in cloud APIs, and say like, okay, everything's going to be uh, an API, you have, you're not just building for the web anymore, you're building for mobile, you're building for tablet, you're building for, uh, you know, the Milo armband, you're building for Google Glass, you're building for all these different uh, applications. It makes a lot of sense to start with an API and then go to design afterwards. Um, and some of that design stuff all happen, needs to happen within the browser, and it doesn't need to happen on server side. Um, there's, in my mind, there's no real good reason to build HTML templates on the server side of the server, um, except for marketing sites and things that uh, you could sort of uh, do a uh, WordPress site instead. Yes, you yeah. want a t-shirt if I get to give them out. <laughs> I'm the only question, I guess. Um, did you start in November or any of the Angular or background, or did you find that you didn't start that way and you decided you needed um, it's more of dog fooding. So if we actually believe the fact that APIs are going to be everything, and uh, if we want to sort of stay on the cutting edge of technologies, we're a small startup. Um, so if we play like the Java game and, and never iterate and never go anywhere, uh, then we will die very quickly. Um, so the idea was more that, okay, these things are cool. They're, they're going to be the next big thing. Um, and you're seeing that sort of trend uh, increase. We might as well jump on board and see what the hell is going on here, and then go back later and figure out how we can then sell uh, our product to those developers. Um, so we're really selfish that way, basically. Um, so this is a, a general idea of going off the stack. Um, we've been doing it for a while now, um, but you know. Um, no one develops on mainframes anymore. You know, everything's sort of going higher and higher up. The, the more that we code in sort of uh, the browser and in uh, these environments, the better we are as uh, developers. And so hopefully you guys all believe in that. Um, I'm going to say my first words about Django now. And it's been six minutes, seven minutes, 54, 55, seven minutes. Um, um, in two, uh, Django was originally launched in 2005. Uh, if you were using Django in 2006 through 2009, you guys were bandits. You were uh, going against the grain. You were completely different than the you know PHP, Perl, JavaScript, uh, sorry, Java world of web development. Um, the world has kind of shifted under uh, sort of the, the feet and saying like. Uh, Django is now like uh, almost more corporate than it is uh, startup. There's a lot of people that use it in uh, very, very you know robust apps. Uh, you're seeing it everywhere now, where before it was not. So, and then there's a lot of newcomers that have come up uh, since then. So you have the, you know the nodes, the goes, the the everything uh, out there as well. So Django in sort of. I know I'm speaking to the wrong crowd here, but it's kind of come up sexy at some point. It's, it's coming to the point where, like, uh, no one really wants to, uh, you know, build templates, uh, you know, HTML templates and serve it and do all those other fun things. It's sort of a uh, an unsexy framework. You know, you're not sort of recruiting people saying like, hey, I'm a big Django shop. You know what I mean? It's like way more on, uh, well, if you want to be cool, you're saying a no Node shop. You're going to JavaScript here, uh, things like that. Um, but the reason why you see this, this shift is because of the fact that the browsers got better. Um, if you look at 2005 when uh, you know, Django was originally an open source, 87% of users were on Internet Explorer. And if you want a year back before that, it was 90 something percent. It was like a, a total monopoly within um, sort of the space. So uh, there was no real sort of need to sort of innovate within that space. Fast forward eight years, uh, you know, 60% market share loss by Internet Explorer uh, in a you know, very short period of time. And Chrome actually was launched in 2008 and came back. We have things like Web Standards that, that uh, came out uh, after that. jQuery wasn't released until 2006, right? Uh, Google Chrome didn't come out until 2008. 
Uh, we didn't have to worry about mobile devices for the web. We just thought that they were, you know, uh, branded things that uh, BlackBerry still uh, was amazing at. Um, I'm going a long way around about saying the fact that um, APIs are, are definitely the way to go. Uh, and if you sort of build on Django's core um, philosophy, you're going to be uh, in a really good space. So what is Django really good at? Right? It's excellent at CRUD operations. So getting stuff from a database, putting stuff into a database. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's a great community around it. If you need search, if you need frameworks, if you need any number of these different things, Django probably has it, and there's you know hundreds of thousands almost of developers that are willing to help you out. There's things like the admin that you don't have to write or, uh, write uh, add, uh, authentication, um, security patches that they release uh, all the time. These are like very core things that you should continue to use uh, and build that way. So um, Embedly at this point uh, uses Django as sort of an API server <coughs> instead of uh, a, a web framework, if that makes sense. So there's no such thing as templates within our, our version of it. That's a lot, I'll get back to that later. Um, yeah, no, no raising hands, man. No raising hands. <laughs> okay, what's well, uh, API? Um, application programming interface. Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, it's the idea that if you hit a certain URL, it will pass back uh, um, data in either JSON, XML, or you know, some people even use HTML uh, to, to do uh, snippets. It's the idea of less, uh, you're not rendering full HTML pages, you're rendering uh, snippets of data instead. So you said earlier you designed your API first. Does that mean you actually write your API first? Then you just, because you said you- That, that was phenomenal, phenomenal. we did. So we, uh, we sort of uh, converted an old app to do that. So we got to pretty much start from scratch. Uh, we were an API company first, so we built an API, uh, the embed the API from scratch, kind of designed it that way. Um, and then went back to some of our older stuff uh, and said, okay, we're going to make this APIs as well. And uh, took out pretty much all our views, wrote, wrote a small wrapper around Ember and just called it that. So basically everything just returns to some or something yeah. similar. Okay. You had a question. You were yeah, so, so are you, because when you had met, he had asked about APIs, and I was thinking, I mean, how many people here um, are familiar with RESTful APIs? And so That is a good question. Does everybody know what a RESTful API is? Yeah. Damn. Wow. Okay, great. I'm speaking uh, to the wrong crowd. So with that is that, you know, because there's, you know, there's doing with the CRUD, there's doing, you know, um, the, uh, the, the gets and the posts, but there's also with, you know, you can do, you know, puts and deletes when you're talking about like a true RESTful API. Absolutely. So are you using just doing, you know, for uh, um, embeddedly uh, RESTful API doing like gets and posts and like doing all your actions through there? Or are you using a framework on top of Django in order to also do deletes and puts? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, some of the older browsers don't do deletes and puts. They don't, but that comes my question. So about you can put extra headers on top of it. So there's X headers that you can use instead. So we have actually X dash embedly dash method as something that we pass back okay. uh, as, a, as a method that tells us if it's a put or if it's a uh, three. Generally, um, uh, that's getting into the weeds. Um, so sometimes you can just get around with, it with query parameters instead, which is a lot of people use because of the fact that some uh, of those actual request headers don't get back. And now we're going real too deep into uh, browser uh, heuristics, so I'm going to stop there. Okay. So you, you use Django now mostly as an API server. Use. Correct. And so is that the best tool for the job? I mean, like you, you sort of started with Django, and so then you backed into it. We did the same thing. But now I'm sort of wondering, you know, should I have it's, this instead in something else? No, it's, I, I still think it's one of the best tools of this job. Um, uh, I think if you all of you knew PHP, and if you were in a company with all PHP developers, and you're like, you know, let's just go with Django instead, that would probably be a terrible idea. Um, but if you, I mean, we wrote our entire other API in Python, it makes a lot of sense to use a, a really hardened, community-driven tool to do something like that uh, versus something that's not as hard. But, um, you can get yourself into trouble and go outside. 
Don't get me wrong, I love Django. Uh, here oh, here we go. But here we go. <laughs> Descent. If all, if all you're doing is serving an API, why use something as heavy as Django rather than just like a web.py or a Flask? Niceties, <laughs> honestly, niceties. Okay. We don't really have to worry about performance all that much because uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people are not hitting this thing. Um, but we do get the fact that you know all the sort of plugins that we get for free. Uh, and, uh, we don't write a lot of good unit tests, so when other people do it for us, like that is that. phenomenal. <laughs> We're better at our jobs other places. Why don't you, uh, do you, did you write your own APIs or do you use something like Django REST framework or something else? We're going to get there. <laughs> I, I will answer that question. Because um, um, it's a good I have like a very long monologue about that. Um, that I don't want to ruin. So you basically steal my thunder. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll give it back to you at the end. Say it again? <laughs> I'll give it back to you at the end. Oh, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, Ember has the idea of, okay, I'm just going to go into a quick Ember spiel for probably four minutes. You either retain it or you don't retain it. Either way, it's the idea that it's not that hard and that there's a lot of parallels to server-side programming as well. Uh, Ember has the idea of an application, which is very uh, similar to a, sort of a Django project. It is the uh, entire container of everything that is going to be in that project. Okay, so you declare it once. Only once you set a few variables and then you're good to go. That root element just says where in that static HTML page is going to go. It also has a router, uh, which is a lot like URLs.py. Uh, we're declaring routes, we're creating resources, which are just uh, routes with children. And then those routes map to um, actual objects and we're good to go. Okay? Uh, we have templates. Pretty much the exact same. Uh, the only thing is it uses different markups. So outlet is much like uh, block content or block page or whatever you guys use. Um, everything underneath it gets rendered into uh, that outlet. Uh, models. Uh, so in the world of JavaScript, there's uh, we're all we're all over the place at this point. Um, but models are just objects. Um, you can make them, uh, and then the markup to go along with those are you know, pretty much the exact same thing as Django. You can have lists as objects, uh, and, but this is the more interesting part when you actually get into getting data. So this is, uh, you know, we're making a RESTful API call here to API uh, users. We're, we're calling, you know, making sure that they're part of the team. These two are the exact same. One's uh, in Ember data, one's in jQuery. Can you do two-way data binding in your templates? Two-way data binding, what do you mean? So like, to have stuff changed, transfer into the models and the other way around? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's that's sort of the magic of handlebars. Um, so if you see back here, they were all ha handlebars templates. Oh, so uh, handlebars, uh, Ember like by itself isn't that cool because it uses handlebars, jQuery underneath it, and then wraps it all uh, within this nice framework. And generally, it's just a, a giant state manager. <coughs> Um, and actually declaring models are you know, the exact same thing you do in, um, in Django. You say this is a field or has it belongs to, which we'll get into later, but um, you know, string, number, whatever. Um, uh, controllers, kind of the closest thing to that is a manager, a Django manager, like user.objects, that kind of thing, sort of a custom manager that does some stuff with data like sorting, and uh, this would actually probably be on the model. Um, but it's sort of the idea that um, there are ways to follow, uh, follow this in. Um, again, the only reason why I'm going through this is because I'm going to say some words later, and you're going to be like, what the hell is he talking about? And at least I, I, I gave you a brief intro. Uh, views are not like Django views at all. Um, views are more like not Django views. Uh, they basically handle uh, events that the user, um, uh, it's way more like jQuery, uh, user um, uh, events. So click, on submit, uh, things like that. Uh, they do some of the rendering, say where the template is, um, but in general, uh, it's way more about the user application side of things. So we're all experts at Ember at this point, right? <coughs> so the yeah. question about Ember, how do you debug it? Um, there's a lot of tools. So they have um, uh, 
<coughs> your console's friends, basically. Um, they have like, you know, log statements in there that you can put into the well, console. Oh, but let me rephrase the question. Do you find it hard to people? Because um, probably a lot of JavaScript running on the browsers, you got to use uh, like Firebug. In protection, Firebox, yes. Yeah. In production, I should say yes. It's hard to debug because it's all minimized, things like that. In development, no. Um, if you've done any sort of jQuery, things like that, and you can do a console dot pod, it's pretty much the same thing. Do you, give, same do you get many issues with? Because um, does Ember come with a jQuery version? Do you have to grab on jQuery version? Uh, do you ever have like uh, integration it, issues between? It defines it. It says like you need to use 0.9 or 2.0 or whatever the 10. We're at 10 now, right? I don't know. Whatever they say. Yeah. No. That's that's sort of not an issue. Um, okay. They do with uh, cross browser as well. Is is not showing an issue. Um, but I don't have a copy of IE6, so I have no idea how it works there. Uh, China, biggest uh, IE6 population out there. 2001 is when IE6 is uh, that much. You're welcome for random facts on Wikipedia that I found now. <laughs> searching the slide. Um, we're going to go into sort of a bunch of different things about what you should do and what you should do, uh, mostly on paradigms. Okay, so. Again, the goal of this talk was not to teach you how to use the tune. It's so that you at least um, intrigued enough so that you want to be like, hey, maybe I'll give this a try sometime. Um, should I go back to what a RESTful API is? Would that be helpful to people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do that here. Um, so how familiar were you with Django? Where, where do you see you? Okay. <coughs> I'm completely new to this stuff. Okay. Um, what tools do you use? Do you like Gmail fan, Facebook? Facebook, uh, yeah, Gmail. <laughs> um, Things that are already set up by Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's nice. Actually, your phone is probably one of the best examples of APIs. And anytime mm -hmm. that it gets data from something. Uh, it's hitting an API and it's not actually getting any Google web page or anything else along those lines. So every time you get mail, it's making a, an API call to a server somewhere that says like, hey, I'm Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> hey, I'm Bobby. Um, my email address is this. Uh, I want to check if I have email. That server will respond with, uh, yes, Bobby, you have no emails except for one uh, from your ex-girlfriend that you don't want to read. Um, <laughs> So that's the general idea of an API, is the fact that like you're making uh, uh, not uh, a user isn't uh, making the call, it's uh, sort of a data uh, transfer between two different points on the web. So it's not like uh, a web page where you go through like home page to some subsection to the sub subsection type of a deal. It's or is that like a whole scenes. other thing? It's behind the scenes. It's not it's not stuff you see, it's stuff like that propels the stars. But it's kind of like simplifying things for the person that's using it, the customer or whatever. It's just all one. Yeah. You just see that one thing. Like right. It just tells you what's right. going yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. It's just, um, so it's asking like a specific question. Right? So instead of, you know, when you had Hotmail, you would go and uh, Microsoft would run your entire page. Where you're like, I just want to know, did I get an email? What's the content of that email? And then using the API, you can separate out getting that content and get it from rendering or, or however you also want to do it. So you apply data transfer mechanism so that you can communicate that same data across different platforms. It be a web browser, be it a mobile phone application, be it anything. It's a unified way to transfer that data. Another way is you have Facebook, for example. You have Facebook mobile, you have Facebook web. Everything is completely different. Subreddits, so yeah, like points. All you have to do is get me data of what I have, and everybody will render up the data. Box. Give me my friends. That's the query you ask to get all your friends. They display how you want to have Facebook. This is also the problem with my business, is because everybody explains an API in 10 different ways. So <laughs> it's like really hard to sell that uh, as well. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's sort of a, a, a lower level uh, issue um, that if you asked 98%, not probably 99% of what users would be like, how is this happening? I don't really care, it just works. Um, 
so that's sort of the idea of a RESTful API. Um, there's uh, different semantics when you do it about put gets, things like that. Um, but uh, we're getting into the weeds, so I'm going to move on. Um, okay. Hey, let's go back to this slide. It's been up for a while. Did you find your models twice? Yes. Uh, yes and no, uh, and we'll get there. Uh, yes and no, and by the way, is my favorite way to answer questions because I'm <laughs> right all the time. Does when you define models, do you have any tools that export models from Django models itself? Um, we thought about building those, but they're pretty much useless because you only generally need a subset of fields. Okay. Um, yes and no, I'm getting there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the main thing, uh, when I started doing this, the main thing that I had a problem doing was separating the front end from the back end because you were, you were always taught that they're sort of the same thing, right? The front end lives on the server, the back end lives on the server. Like, I don't understand why that can't be the same thing. When you start separating the two, it gets a little hairy. Um, but if you start that way and say, okay, all my front end code is going to be, you know, built by Grunt and, which is my next slide, so I'll get there. Um, if you've never heard of Grunt, it's like an awesome, uh, JavaScript task runner. It does absolutely nothing but run other cool stuff. Uh, so like uh, SAS and uh, uh, Minify tools, Ugify, <coughs> which is one of my favorite code names for things, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But basically, Grunt is going to start up a server. Um, that server is going to just serve a static web page, and then every time you change a JavaScript document, it's going to reload that, that uh, page. So the common paradigm in Django is to change something, refresh, change something, refresh. Uh, Grunt sort of takes care of that all in the background, so it automatically refreshes. It uh, makes your life a whole lot easier. It also does things like builds it, so uh, minifies everything for you. Builds again, you're building an actual static web page. You're building, you know, uh, you might as well use Dreamweaver at some point because you're just building a static web page. Uh, that static web page is then going to call a bunch of APIs that pull your data in and make fun things like lists and to-do apps and uh, whole dashboards on a lot of fun, fun things. Mm -hmm. So just think of the Django side of things as an API server. Like, don't even bother with building a single template out of there and just focus on the front end side of stuff. Are you going to talk about performance and at some point, and, and, you know, maybe we can talk about that at the end. Okay. Uh, but it's uh, it's less data transfer, so you you, know, you assume um, it's our site is a lot faster, basically, because it doesn't have to make a damn. I said later. Um, uh, XSS headers is getting into the weeds, but it's something that you're going to come across and you're going to be like, damn, why didn't anybody tell me about it? Basically, you're running a Grunt server on uh, localhost, you're running a Django uh, server on localhost. Those two things need to talk to each other. Uh, the only way that the browser is going to let that happen is if you set uh, access control headers, uh, which are very simple. It just says, hey, from this origin allow anything, uh, it's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, it's one of the, the ways that uh, browsers protect you from uh, mean things, but when you want it to happen, this is just a um, context processor, I believe, middleware, whatever the word is for it, uh, and there's a list there. Um, we'll probably post these slides somewhere. Um, who asked about REST frameworks? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a terrible idea to start, uh, and it's not because I don't believe that those developers are very good at their jobs, and that you know there's Tasty Pie, there's um, uh, he wrote Haystack too, uh, whatever his name is, uh, good developer, um, and then there's Django REST framework. The problem is, is that you have no idea what's going on when you start uh, doing stuff like this. Um, uh, at least that's my sort of things. Uh, so you have a lot of data transfer going on. You have the, the back end, uh, the front end is trying to call the back end, the back end is trying to have it turned out at the front end. Unless you sort of build uh, the first pass yourself, uh, it's really hard to understand the underlying mechanics or else then you just get caught in the weeds and you're like, why the hell isn't Django Framework doing what I wanted to do? And then you're reading 300 pages of documentation to figure out, oh, I need to set true on some uh, Boolean somewhere that I didn't know about. So actually writing the API yourself at first for at least Ember or any sort of RESTful framework is that you have, uh, you should go to the class-based view ones because the class-based views are the best. Uh, but you set like a simple class-based view, right, with uh, that either takes an ID or doesn't take an ID. Um, and it does 
and then a, 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 a very simple view. Uh, obviously, I had to use a very small font to get this all in here, but it's literally 16 lines of code. Uh, it basically says, we all know what's going on here, right? User view. Do you know what class-based view is? Class-based view. Great. Awesome. Uh, if it's a get request, if there's a primary key, uh, do an objects.get, right? If it's uh, a, a get request, uh, use the the get request to actually filter objects. Uh, if it uh, doesn't have anything, just call all, return it as uh, application JSON, done. Like, so you can build these APIs really quickly, and it's really super helpful uh, in the beginning to just build it yourself and say, like, okay, this is gonna be awesome. Uh, if you've never seen it, uh, Django Forms Models has model to dict um, which basically allows you to turn any object into a dictionary. It's incredibly useful for a lot of different things, except that it doesn't handle time very well. Uh, the front end of that is, um, uh, again, very simple. You declare uh, a few models. You do uh, user.find one. It makes an API call to the back, restful, all great. How's that being now? Say it again? So, if the question is, do you have to define the models twice? You say yes or no. It seems like yes. Uh, yes, you have to define models twice. No, you don't need all the fields. Right. I hope that's my next slide. No, it's not. Damn it. Uh, make the front end dumb. Uh, uh, whenever you're doing some of these things, uh, it's the, the best uh, case scenario is that the front end doesn't know any business logic. The only thing it knows how to do is to get data and uh, display data. And that's it. Um, and, and like fill out a form, save data, and everything else. But the de generally the data is transfer. Whenever you start putting business logic within JavaScript, it's like a horrible idea for your life, mostly because it's impossible to debug afterwards. Um, so just remember that, uh, and I told you. Um, <coughs> neither, I mean, this is like sort of a common problem all over the place, but you, you are gonna have to deal with authentication yourself. Um, so just think about it. <laughs> yeah, that one. Um, no, but 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 in, in our facility, we again we have like a, a stupid uh, uh, library that we use for Ember um, uh, that creates a serialized review, but it also allows us to declare an auth, which says like if uh, you know if the user is for a user if it's an, an actual the actual user or if it's a super user, then say yes, it can access that. If not, then just uh, throw a um, a value error. This is, uh, there's decorators in Django to do this for you. Uh, we wrote our own because we have various other random memberships of organizations and like really stupid stuff that we probably shouldn't have. Um, but that's sort of the idea, is to say like, okay, uh, uh, nobody's gonna take care of sort of who has access to what, so make sure you handle it yourself. Yes. So where is the Ember class coming from? Uh, Ember is just the library that we wrote. Uh, it's a stupid library that just uh, takes a model, a serializer, which the serializer just says like, hey, this is going to be dumped out. The view is just going to say, this is what happens, like get post filter, and the auth just says who can auth as, uh, access it. Did you publish this, and should we, be, should we use it? You should not use it, because we haven't published it, because um, it's not documented, and it's uh, probably a piece of crap. Um, <laughs> but we like it because we wrote it, so therefore, uh, we love it. We think it's like the best piece of software that's ever been written in the whole entire What's the database you use? We use Postgres. Okay. Yes, Postgres. How do you handle that value or client? So um, so we so class based views um, there's a call function right so when it does the call function we overwrite that and do it ourselves so if there's any sort of function we pass back an error and says like uh, you're being a jerk face don't do that um, and then move on the list uh, generally it doesn't happen all that often we try to do some logging here and there user tests. Um, you are, however, uh, allowed to mix and match. So uh, we did read, uh, write our whole entire dashboard uh, in uh, Ember, but we didn't want to do stupid stuff like uh, rewrite our password stuff. Like that's just dumb. Uh, like password reset, um, 
things like that. Um, so we still allow that to go back to the Django database uh, and handle that because it was already pre-written and no one really wanted to do uh, that uh, thing, but everything else was up. So, yeah. so does that mean that some of the URLs pass straight through to the Django server and some of uh, the Ember.js right. handle? Absolutely. Uh, mostly the index is all, well, go ahead, answer it. I know you want to. For me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, any, I mean, it's pretty simple to just configure Nginx to pass some URLs right through. Uh, all the other ones, you, you, whenever you deploy something like Ember, you kind of have to do some tricky stuff for every URL returns the same page. So, some tricky stuff? It's not that tricky, but yeah. <laughs> because it's an app, you have to return the static page and rewrite the URL and let the app map its own routing. So I guess that's kind of some of the interesting stuff where, you know, you, as a beginner getting in, trying to figure this stuff out, and then you're getting to... Yeah, but you're not, you're not dealing with it until deployment. And then at deployment, uh, <coughs> I mean... And it's mostly about making it work across all browsers. Like, um, new browsers have push states, stuff like that, so stuff just works by itself, but you got to handle legacy browsers. This is the best part about it because I have Bob to do with those things. Yeah, <laughs> I just uh, yeah. There's definitely a learning curve when you want to deploy it to production. Right. But there's some great tutorials about that. Yeah. How do you deal with nested model relationships? Do you flatten them? Do you God, <laughs> God, I beat that. <laughs> I beat that all over the place. Um, so you can use relations. Ever does have the idea of relations. Um, uh, where you can do like declare uh, book author um, and then uh, you know foreign keys all over the place and then the models JS also has uh, has many belongs to um, you're doing side loading at that point so you're giving it a list of IDs and then uh, in the actual response you're saying like okay these are if I have a book these are all the authors all the way around if I have an author these are all the books that uh, they've written actually I was asking about the API not from the Ember point of view so do you just return a URL where you can find those and do No, you actually return it with a response. So, it um, it's a case by case. Right? Yes, right. a lot of it's case by case. That's why we wrote that extra library, that serializer library, because um, you every single time that you want to do slide loading, it's like a whole uh, pain in the ass. Um, so, a lot of people actually don't even use it. Um, there's a lot of recommendations out there to just not even bother with has many or belongs to and actually make the call uh, API calls every single time that you need those side loads. So a lot of the time you're actually loading a user and then you're going to load all the uh, organizations that are user uh, things and only when they click an action where they need uh, that side loaded data then you go fetch it. It's still fast because you're only passing back uh, JSON data um, so it doesn't actually slow down the user all that much. When you return serialized objects in your API, are you returning one at a time or a list? Uh, or did you? Either one. Right, if you do a filter, like if you want, give me all the teams yeah. uh, that start with A, we right. pass back a list. If you say, I want ID 4, we're going to give you one. Gotcha. Um, don't pass it back all the fields. It's a dumb idea, uh, especially starting with like password. Don't pass that back to the front end. Um, <laughs> Uh, most, uh, like a lot of fields are, are, are generally for housekeeping purposes, right? Like date joined, uh, last seen, things like that. The, the front end doesn't need to know about them, um, so don't pass them back. Uh, because then you, you, you uh, sort of run into a whole lot of different other issues. Um, I've come across this uh, at least once. Where people think that they, when they start using like a, a complex framework, that they're like, yeah, we've got to get rid of jQuery. It's the worst. Um, it's generally not the enemy. It's it's uh, still like a, a phenomenal tool, and you can st uh, still continue to use it. Mostly because of a lot of uh, cross-browser stuff. Uh, it has a little bit of bloat, but I mean, especially in Ember, like everything has this like this dot pound whatever, which gives the current element that it's working on, uh, which is super useful for a lot of different things. Um, uh, I've seen people use it in other different of these MPCs <coughs> as well, uh, and it's a, a good decision. Um, one of the problems with doing this, and especially with APIs in general, is that you tend to worry a lot, um, mostly about authentication. 
Um, a lot of it has to deal with like, okay, uh, does this user have access to this page, things like that. Most, again, a lot with server-side stuff, but when you have just an API out in the open that anybody can hit, uh, it becomes sort of a nightmare of tracking down like who's hitting what and what's going on at the back end. Um, so this is actually, so when we originally wrote our uh, serializer in our library, we had, you know, slash API slash blogs returned all the blogs. Like, yes, it, it works, it's amazing. And then we realized slash API slash users does the same thing. Yes, it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, we're returning every single uh, user that we have uh, in our database if we do that. Um, so when I say that you should probably write your own API and not use uh, some of your REST frameworks. I'm sure they deal with some of these edge cases, but uh, when you actually go through and think about it, and you're like, oh god, I don't want to do that, it makes it a little bit easier in the end to figure yeah, out. Yeah, general does pagination. Perfect. Um, yeah, then you're in a whole separate weeds uh, because of the fact that uh, like Ember Data doesn't support pagination. Yeah, uh, Ember Data is not that great, so you can use jQuery and figure that out yourself. Um, Deploy static, Bob talked a little bit about this and you were like, uh, deploying is a nightmare. It sort of is and it sort of isn't. Um, yes and no, again, one of my favorite things. Um, uh, basically you're serving a static file from uh, Nginx. Anything that's under, you know, slash, for us is like slash organizations, always gets redirected to that one index.html uh, page and then the router in Ember takes care of it and uh, gets all the right data and puts it in and everything's pretty. Um, the bad thing about that is that you also have to serve the Django application from the same domain so that the authentication works all correctly and everybody's happy. So it's just writing some proxy pass rules. Yeah, yeah nailed it. Um, uh, that say like, okay, slash API, uh, you know, slash login goes to uh, the Django server. Everything else comes to that uh, index.html page. And if it's something we don't recognize, we just throw a random for error. It took us a long time. And by me and me, that guy right there. Uh, this slide will, uh, you will probably think, uh, one day, one of you is going to go and use Ember, and you're going to be like, God, I really love that guy, Sean, because he taught me about deferred readiness. Uh, other than that, you'll be like, why the hell is this up here? Uh, deferred readiness is a, a very thing that's, uh, something that's very deep down inside of Ember that basically says, um, when you're loading up the application, it says, stop. Uh, don't do anything, Ember. Uh, wait for me to tell you to go, and then go. So, the, like the simple version of this code is uh, is this, where it says, you know, defer readiness, use jQuery, it's amazing, uh, dot ready, and then uh, we grab the current user, whoever's logged in, set the current user, and then tell Ember to go. Um, it's a big pain in the ass when you start dealing with the router because you're going to get into like a weird state where you don't have a user yet but they've already told you what organization they want access to but the organization doesn't know whether the user is attached to it and then the user doesn't know what the profile is and all this other bullshit. Um, so the idea is just to tell it to stop whatever it's doing. Again, none of you, half of you are never going to use it but the 1.1% that does you're going to really so if I, if I start Firebug, if I change the user to something else, does that mean I can then access that other user? Or yeah, absolutely. Do you check for that? This uh, is why we authenticate. Was, that's what I was getting to. Yeah, no. Uh, everything has to go off of that current user. And, and Django uh, you know, has that session state that deals with you know, who's actually logged in. So if you say, like, OK, user.set ID equals 20, and you're like, I'm going to take that user. It's not going to work because then all the calls after that are going to be like, you're the wrong user. You're already logged in as X, Y, and Z. Um, so this is goes this goes back to even more of like why we use Django is because of the fact that these tools are hardened that we have security evolved um, from the get go that there's like a bunch of nerds out there uh, that are dealing with it so that I don't have to. Uh, we actually got to the next slide. Um, it's probably not Ember's fault. Um, so uh, there's so uh, when we first launched this, we had like a big TechCrunch launch. We got a bunch of people to cover it. We're like, you were awesome. We switched plans. We launched new products. Uh, everybody inside the uni uh, United States was like, yeah, you're off awesome. Everybody outside the United States was like, you guys suck. And we're like, why? Because they couldn't actually log into the application that we just created and spent three months uh, using Ember to build. Uh, it turns out that. Um, 
uh, I think it was in models dot uh, underscore meta slash object dot verbose name. Someone's going to tell me that's wrong, but uh, verbose name basically takes uh, into account the language preference of the user, and Django comes with a, a whole bunch of translations for like username. Um, so we had this one guy in Brazil that actually debugged it. We uh, deployed a whole new version of uh, Ember that was unminified so we can track this down so that we could use Firefox to, uh, uh, you know, Firelight or Chrome tools to basically see what's going on. It turns out that um, when you use verbose name, it passes back Usario for username instead of username. Um, so we spent literally two weeks blaming Ember, um, pretty much thinking about we're going to rip this whole goddamn thing out and go straight back to Django. You don't calm down. Um, but it turned out to be like we were just screwed up. Um, so when you're actually dealing with it, you have to look at the API. You have to figure out like all the stupid edge cases that you're never going to remember uh, that you coded against like you know six months ago, but they actually exist. Um, and translation is actually one of the ones that we came across uh, that will probably happen at some point. So it's a settings file. So one change in the setting file that says like, hey, don't use uh, translations if you're that was 45 minutes. That is the best that I have for you. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk. Um, if not, I got nothing. Are you sponsoring beers tonight? Nice. Nice. <laughs> How do you deal with media? Um, so we are a media company, so we generally just deal with URLs. Um, uh, we have, we don't have any file uploads or uh, like image uploads or anything else along those lines. Um, so. Don't is the correct answer there. We do. We have general URLs. We grab the media from somebody else. There's a whole business based on. Do you stream responses in your at all? Do we stream responses? From, yeah. So we have like Socket IO stuff that like uh, works for like real time results of some product that we haven't finished yet. Um, so if you actually load up our app, you'll see errors from that streaming result. Um, so yes. But it's built completely different. <coughs> that's not, I, don't, I don't believe it uses Django, right? No, no, that's Node.js. Uh, it's not going to He thinks it's better than us. <laughs> Do you think it's a good idea to slowly transition from a stat more static template driven page to uh, an API? So we were considering in our project to just have a few of the data points that we need that we want to have more dynamic on the front end and that are more like you know, yeah. interactive to start using it there and then like, you know. Yeah, we were done. Would we you, went would like. you use Ember in well, that case or something? Or? It doesn't really matter, to tell you the truth. Um, a lot of people use Backbone for, uh, especially on page transitions, if you want to go like in between like smaller aspects of it because it's a smaller library, so you don't have to load this whole big ass thing uh, just to do something very simple. Um, but yeah, I mean, you sort of have to have a problem. If the problem presents itself, where you, you say like, okay, I'm going to use uh, a f you know front end JavaScript MVC framework, then play around with a bunch. I'm not telling you that Ember is the right way because it's not the right way for a lot of different people. Uh, it's just the one that fits us the best. Okay, can you, can you tell? Okay. You mentioned uh, sessions for handling authentication, so that means your RESTful API is stateful and. And knows of the user. So you have sticky sessions on the server side? Yes. That's because we serve the same, we're on the same domain, so we serve the same API request and our requests off the, uh, whatever, to the whatever. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Can you talk a little bit more about, like, at the very beginning when you were making the decision to use uh, Ember as opposed to? Like the, the decision I'm trying to make now is Ember versus Angular, right? And I'm not sure I... I Do like functions or objects? Sort of agnostic. Uh, so I'm an object guy. I love objects. I mean, it's just the way my brain works. Um, uh, Angular has like a really hardcore cult following. Um, you know, back by Google and like those people will tell you that you're an idiot for using anything but it. It's faster, it's X, Y, and Z and things like that. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all, I personally think it's all personal preference. What, wherever you're going to be the most productive is the one that you should pick. Uh, so to do the to-do list on either side, I got halfway through the uh, Angular one because my brain didn't work that way. And the Ember one, I was able to finish it. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not that smart either, so. Yo. Can you talk a little bit more about how you manage to keep business logic away from the front end? Um, you know, do you have very rich high level APIs? Or yeah, I mean, you can write your own custom APIs for anything. So, like, give me an example. Updating a plan, right? So we have updating a plan. Like, I want to be on, like, the next tier of plan. Um, we could have the sort of the business logic there to figure out, we know what state you're at, and going to the next state, we could, like, figure out that and then send a bunch of different API requests that says, like, update this value here, update this value here, update this value here. Instead, we just say, like, okay, there's a separate endpoint that says update plan for X with Y, uh, and then we send that back to the, uh, the back end. The back end figures out, you know, does this person have all that things. We also have to, once you update one thing in our system, it has to go out to 14 other different places. It has to go to billing, it has to go to uh, the API uh, key for authentication so we know that you have those things and a uh, hundred different other things. The front end's not going to do that, so we have to send it to the back end. Yeah, but think about transactions and also think about the fact that you don't control the code of the browser. So anything that's security related, you have to do it. No, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I'm saying that that's, that's a very big part for us. Because we need to keep adding the API to support yeah. the, yeah. the, the functions. It never ends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you think about obsolescence of a framework like this? Like the API is like something that seems like it'll last quite a bit longer than the front end. So do you anticipate like the Ember will sort of? Yeah, I mean, you might die next week. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Served as well so far. Um, um, how, how old is this? This app, six yeah, months. Ember. Oh, Ember? Yeah. Ember. So Ember actually came out of Sprout Core uh, 2 or something like that. Yeah, so it's been around for a little while. Uh, a bunch of idiots decided to like rebrand re it, uh, give it a cool logo, and then uh, sell a consulting company around it. Um, they've done a pretty good job so far. Uh, it's still alive. They've gone from uh, pre-1.0. We started using it at like 0.9. Um, and then now I think they're almost at 1 this point. Um, it seems like there's a decent amount of backing. I mean, um, you know, Zendesk uses it, Square uses it, um, a bunch of other people that they tout use it. Um, it's not completely there yet, but it will get there. Short-term decisions. You mentioned how you were, how model to dict um, had time problems, time date problems? Yeah, so it won't convert like a date time to like a, a UTC string or Along those lines, you have to do it yourself. Um, so we have a thin wrapper that says like, is time, uh, you know, make it a UCT timestamp or whatever. Okay. Because I mean, there's time I'm, zones. I'm wondering why why you would store it anything other than just a Unix timestamp anyway. Uh, so when Django gets it from the backend database, it automatically converts it to a uh, date time. So. I think uh, you can set it to get. Not that smart, man. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. A uh, couple of people questions. Do, do you tend to have um, separate developers for the skill set the front and back? And there's only six of us. Uh, so I wish that I could be like, yeah, I got a team of 30 <coughs> working on this bad boy. Uh, no, it's uh, uh, everybody sorts of does everything. Uh, not because uh, uh, we want it that way, it's just because nothing would ever get done if we didn't have sort of journalists. Uh, so these guys will write JavaScript and then also write Django. In a perfect world, uh, if you had a large enough team, the JavaScript developers don't need, only need to talk to the back-end guys you know, once a month. You know, sometimes I think that if that's a case that boxes is too small, it's like, okay, you can do really fancy JavaScript, and, uh, but then you come to business logic, right? So it's right. Think how badass that developer is going to be oh, if, if all they do is Ember <laughs> yeah. all day. That guy's going to be amazing. Well, what are some, some of the downsides of the application platform? Yeah, you're going to go there, huh? Right now, everybody's parade. Um, uh, it's convoluted, absolutely. Uh, it's convoluted. Uh, it's sort of hard to grasp. There's sort of a learning curve where uh, you hate yourself for a week because you don't understand what's going on, and then it like uh, gets better after that. 
Uh, so the learning curve is tough, especially if you don't have somebody. I mean, I, I spent three weeks uh, learning it and then had to teach the whole team that. So it like slows you down a little bit, uh, especially in the beginning. Um, the pre-versions, uh, we started at like 0.9. They, can tr uh, they changed the uh, entire way the router worked on us, like underneath our feet. So we had to go back and rewrite the whole goddamn thing, which um, was not the best day in the office. Um, but it wasn't that bad. Um, they've stabilized a lot of things. Ember data is not great. Um, it's really good at getting data. It's terrible at saving data. So uh, if you do dot .save there's, and something uh, an error happens in the back end, you'll never get notified on the front end. So you can never tell the user that, hey, uh, the support ticket that you just sent didn't actually get saved, so I hate you. Um, it basically just uh, dies silently, which is bad. So we had to re uh, write our own forms handling. Uh, library as well uh, to be able to handle cases like that, which is just a thin wrapper on jQuery submit. I said a lot of words there. No, I can never figure that out either. Um, um, the way that we do it, I think run, um, everything is in a module, much like Django projects where you have you know, accounts, buildings, uh, uh, profiles, things like that. We have just files to say, you know, uh, dashboard keys, clients, uh, random stuff like that, utils. Um, there's, there's a Grunt plugin, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but you put some um, you know, tags in the index HTML and it, and it automatically pulls in the files. Short answer is yes, we should do that. Uh, long answer is no, we don't. Yeah. Um, I have a browser question. So I, I also have the same issue with Ember not understanding it first. Um, yeah, and I right. ended up using uh, Nokia. And one of the fun things about Nokia, I mean, it's really slow in Spanish, but it works in every browser. <laughs> you know, I unfortunately have to support the like, IE7 and the 6 um, so we have a different technical audience. So anybody that understands what an API is generally uh, doesn't use Internet Explorer 6. So if you actually, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's like literally, it's like a Venn diagram and they never touch. Um, um, so we're sort of lucky that way. And if uh, honestly, to tell you the truth, if you come in with Internet Explorer, we don't want you to sign up anyways because you're just going to be a headache to us. Um, this is again being a small company. We get to say things like this and get away with it. IE10 works really well. <laughs> yeah, IE10 works great. Um, uh, you know, get a new operating system. Um, <laughs> we played around with it to IE8, uh, and it works pretty well there. Um, uh, I don't know what happens when they come in with IE7 or 6. To tell you the truth, I think it just vomits on them. And they <laughs> Didn't we set up the? Uh, Upgrade your browser page. Oh, okay, that's what it does. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, yeah. I mean, but we use, on the front end, we use things like Foundation, which is only good to IE8 as well. So, that throws up on them too. So, is Ember okay at garbage collection and that kind of stuff? Have you had problems with like memory increasing? I haven't. Okay. Um, I've never seen it. I've heard it reported where if you get in some strange state that it will uh, just kill a browser. I've never seen it done to me. Supposedly it does that a lot better than Mac phone. It's one of the aggravated yeah. features like cleaning up um, callbacks and stuff like that. Which you have to manually do with Mac right? I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Alright, last one. I'm gonna, I'll let you guys get out of here. So you said to deploy using the Proxy faster, something uh, the game action thing. For development, are you using something like front connect proxy? Yeah. To do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we actually set up a proxy for the Django app to some, some I think Sean still runs it as a separate like you can I'm old school man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can put a little like Thanks for coming, I appreciate it. Thank you.